So good morning, also from my side. Um, I had a talk already on Monday, so maybe you know me. Um, uh, my name is Tanya Bakker. I work at the research center at CERO. Um, and today my talk, I studied cellular biology and biochemistry. So the previous talk had a good introduction into what I'm going to talk about. So um, at the end of the talk, he mentioned several diseases that can be treated with uh, hemp and cannabis. And the aim of my talk today is to explain how, um, how these uh, substances that are found in hemp and cannabis affect the human body and in which way they can bring, uh, uh, bring healing to certain diseases. So the title of my talk is Hemp, the, orthomolecular, the Perfect Orthomolecular Medicine. So I will start by explaining a little bit about what orthomolecular medicine is. Um, okay. So orthomolecular medicine is a field, is a field in uh, medicine that has been um, established for several years but it's not really mainstream medicine yet. Uh, Linus Pauling was the... Yeah. Linus Pauling was the first to uh, bring about this term orthomolecular medicine and br brought the foundation to this. Um, so this is this guy, he was a chemist and uh, he was awarded a Nobel Prize. In fact, he was awarded two Nobel Prizes. And uh, uh, he wasn't really happy with the way medicine was taught and the way he studied very extensively how molecules interact with each other, how molecules interact with the body, what happens, how the, these bonds are formed and such things. And um, he postulated that um, inside of a human body, there's an optimal nutritional environment. So, and even many decades later, um, even science and medicine proved that inside of our bodies there's a perfect homeostatic uh, state in our bodies when our bodies are healthy. And he said, uh, he postulated that um, every human being has an individual biochemistry. So, um, in um, he wasn't really happy with the way medicine was, uh, uh, was being performed, that you come to a doctor with a complaint, you get a basic biochemical testing in a laboratory, and then they see, okay, so cholesterol is this value, this is this value, and we have to fix this and fix that. And not regardless of how one is feeling and how one is, uh, what, kind of, um, what kind of symptoms you have. So, uh, the basic medical principle was you have to fix this value that came up in the lab test, you have to um, elevate this value or reduce this value. And um, he, he believed, and uh, this was the basic of orthomolecular medicine, that every body is individual and that uh, not every value of blood pressure, sugar, cholesterol is optimal for every body. So, um, uh, the basic principle of orthomolecular medicine is that there is an optimal homeostatic uh, uh, status in the body and when the disease comes up, it's a consequence of a disbalance. Either there's a lack of certain minerals, nutrients, neurotransmitters, hormones, or an excess of one of these natural chemicals. And he believed that the best principle is to just find out what happened that this balance occurred and fix this balance. Not the way medicine usually does it, that when there's something wrong, you take a drug, a medicine, a chemical that then fixes this. But you don't come to the root cause, but just fix what's wrong. So he believed that the best way to treat um, illnesses and diseases is by natural substances. So if you're lacking magnesium, you give more magnesium. If you're lacking tryptophan, you add more tryptophan. Not that you block something with a chemical and things like that. So this is the basic principle of orthomolecular medicine. So if you come to an orthomolecular doctor 
it's not mainstream. There are a few very brave souls in the world that have practices that are based in this. Um, so, the first uh, encounter with an orthomolecular doctor will be similar than for a general GP. So, you come to a doctor, you have an extensive uh, talk about your problems, you get basic biochemistry, but then the treatment is very different. Uh, with an orthomolecular doctor, we'll never get synthetical drugs or synthetic medicines that will block something and things like that. Here with the uh, orthomolecular principle, you always take a look at what's the basic uh, thing that went wrong in the body. Either you're lacking something, you have too much of something, and then that is, um, that is brought into balance. And a typical medicine you will get from an orthomolecular doctor is either vitamin C, or uh, vitamin C is a typical uh, vitamin. In, in orthomolecular medicine, the, the quantities of the, uh, let's say, vitamin D or C or tryptophan or progesterone or uh, magnesium or any minerals is usually much higher than what the recommended values are for daily intake. And um, the logic behind this is, let's say with a very good example of this is with vitamin C. A recommended daily dosage for vitamin C is 60 milligrams. And this is calculated in such... Uh, they, they came up with this value um, in this way. So if a, if a person is completely healthy, never encounters a cold, never gets upset, never, um, never comes into encounter with any environmental toxins and so forth, and lives really happily, uh, drinks perfect water, eats perfect food, then really 60 milligrams would be enough. But if you come across, uh, if you meet up with someone that is, has a cold, your body will need 10 times the amount of vitamin C. If you spend five minutes with someone who's smoking, your body will need 500 more vitamin C to fight those radicals. If you uh, eat uh, food that isn't very healthy, if you drink water that isn't uh, the best water and stuff like that, your body needs a lot, a lot more vitamins. So instead of 60 milligrams that uh, the general medicine thinks it's enough, for, from an orthomolecular doctor you will get 10 grams per day of vitamin C to treat colds, or cancer, support therapy, and so forth. So the, the amounts here are very different, and the logic behind it is to support the body and to get uh, really the maximum nutritional balance in the body so that the body has everything it needs that it can fight whatever is wrong, disease, viruses, or whatever. So this is vitamin C you will typically get if you um, you have a lot of cold, you have a low immunity, you, uh, you're, well, you're fighting with cancer and so forth. Uh, tryptophan is also a very commonly prescribed medicine. Uh, tryptophan is an amino acid and it's a precursor to synthesis of serotonin. Serotonin is a secondary messenger, very important in the brain. Uh, it's one of the happy molecules it ha we have. Our bodies make it themselves, but they, they uh, need tryptophan um, to make it. And depression and neurosis and panical disorders, they're all characteristics for lacking serotonin. And if you want to fix this or alleviate these symptoms, you take uh, a lot more tryptophan, so the biochemistry in the body shifts towards making more serotonin and you balance this out. Um, orthomolecular adopters have great success with treating depression in this way, and they, um, in three months they have a regression of symptoms for 95% with zero side effects that usually antidepressant classical drugs have. Uh, progesterone is another case of an orthomolecular medicine. Uh, it's a hormone. Uh, it's uh, generally used uh, 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 for menopausal problems, for polycystic ovaries, for endometriosis, for all kind for uh, women that have difficulties conceiving children and things like that. So the aim, the point here is that the orthomolecular medicine uses its body's natural substances to bring about balance. So you take either 
um, hormones, vitamins, minerals, um, neurotransmitters, amino acids, lipids. Um, the, th the, the idea behind this is that once these substances come into our bodies, our bodies recognize it as their own molecules and they know exactly what to do with it. The difference with it, if you take a synthetic <coughs> medicine or a drug, it comes into the body and it brings about an effect, but it actually uh, worsens the disbalance we have, not if it makes it better. So the aim is, if you want a healthy body, you need to have a balance, a homeostatic, um, well, um, well regulated balance of everything in your body. And that, that's, a, um, that's what is necessary for the body to be healthy. And in a natural state, the body is healthy. Everything that happens, uh, especially chronic diseases, it has been shown for a majority of chronic diseases that there's a biochemical disbalance. Um, boron and magnesium in also cases. Boron has been found as one of these um, uh, very unlikely candidates. Um, it has been shown that 99% uh, of people that suffer from uh, arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis have a lack of boron. And in classical medicine, arthritis is considered incurable. But orthomolecular medicine has found that if you supplement these people with boron, 80% uh, of symptoms will disappear. So this is, uh, this is just to know that uh, it's important to know biochemistry and then see what's wrong and fix that, not then add new chemicals that will, that will just deal with the symptoms but not with the cause problem. Okay, and so where, do, where does cannabis or where do cannabinoids fit into this picture? It has been, um, uh, cannabinoids are uh, lipid molecules that are signaling molecules in our bodies. Um, and uh, uh, we know, since it's a hemp congress, we all know that, um, that uh, in hemp we have plant-derived cannabinoids, and they're called phytocannabinoids. But the surprising news came uh, when uh, scientists found that also our own bodies make cannabinoids. Um, it was funny that when scientists were studying drugs and the effect of drugs on our bodies, they found very quickly to which receptors in our body alcohol binds, to which opioids bind, and so forth. And when all this was already known, they still couldn't find how cannabinoids function in our body, or to, where, to which sites, to which receptors it binds to bring about the effect that we know as being high. And uh, it was 15 years later that they found receptors that are responsible for binding these cannabinoids. And then they, these receptors bind and produce a signal in the cell which causes then us to be high or healing effects or whatever. But when they were studying this, they found to a big surprise to everyone that not only uh, do we have receptors for them and receptors that we have everywhere in the body practically, um, majority of cells in our bodies have receptors for cannab cannabinoids. Not only do we have receptors, but we also have um, a mechanism in our bodies that we, that we make our own cannabinoids. And these are called endocannabinoids, so we make them ourselves inside of our bodies. And this was a great surprise. So of course scientific uh, studies continue to find out uh, what kind of cannabinoids we make and what are they there for. So nature uh, made sure that we have a reserve in our bodies of these endocannabinoids. So the interesting question naturally was, what do they do? And um, it took naturally many years and many um, million dollars of research before they found out what it does. Um, and we'll get there in a second. So this is, uh, this, these are usually um, cannabinoids we, found in, uh, we find in hemp, in, in the cannabis. So these are, um, uh, a typical plant of cannabis has uh, 85, now already we, we know of 85, but probably 100 and even more, uh, different molecules of cannabinoids. Uh, uh, these are the five that are most well known, and these are the five that uh, are kind of classes of cannabinoids. 
but there are 85, at least 85 different ones in every plant. And uh, what do they do? So we already talked about this, that we, in our bodies we have receptors for these molecules. So when these molecules come into our bodies, uh, from a plant naturally, they bind to receptors. And so far, so far, so far two receptors were found. They're called CB1 and CB2. So cannab uh, cannabidoid one receptor and cannabidoid two receptor. And uh, uh, CB1 is located mainly in the brain and in uh, the neuronal system of the body. And CB2 is located uh, everywhere in the body, in the organs, in muscles, and so forth. And CB1 is the receptor to which THC, the most well-known cannabinoid, binds. And this is when you activate this receptor, you get this typical, um, typical uh, reaction we know from being high. So the, because the, uh, the, the receptors are in our, in our brain and in our neural system, so um, that's why we get naturally these high effects. And then the CB2 is located everywhere else in the body, and other cannabinoids from, um, from hemp binds to these receptors and activated, giving all kinds of reactions in the body and all kinds of responses to this stimulation, which we'll see later. So this, this image shows a bit how this is working, and uh, this is an image of two neurons. So, um, um, I'll try to demonstrate. Can you hear me okay? No. I'm okay. Uh, okay, so I'll try to demonstrate. So uh, in neurons, the, the, all the uh, signaling functions in this way. So a neuron uh, looks something like this, so it's uh, like a hand and then it branches, uh, it branches out. And uh, then this is another um, neuron. And then for them to communicate, signaling molecules have to pass from one neuron to another. And so this looks something like this, and this is empty, and here's messenger molecules come from one to the next one, and when these molecules bind to this one, then this cell knows exactly what to do, and it will shoot out a signal that then will come and, um, to a muscle so that the muscle knows that when we think that we have to lift something, that the muscles contract, and so forth. So this is the basic principle of how signaling uh, functions in the body and how signaling is com comes from our brains where we decide that we want to drink a cup of coffee but then the muscle actually does this. And then these molecules, uh, cannabinoids, are such signaling molecules. And um, it was interesting to see that they were found so all <laughs> and so all the other uh, receptors that were found for opioids, for all other drugs, are always found on this membrane, so the one that passes the signal on. And why they didn't find the receptors for cannabinoids so long is because they are located on this membrane, on this cell. And it was very strange to find that this is the only one that is on this side. And um, the reason why it's this is because it has a completely different function. And uh, in a healthy body, cannabinoids have a very important function. It's a principal SOS mechanism in the body. Uh, usually when we're happy and relaxed and really feeling good, our endocannabinoid system that we have in our bodies, it's not functioning, it's shut down. We don't need it. The only time we need this, our own cannabinoids to get synthesized, is when we're under stress. So, and um, the basic setup that is made in our bodies it's so that this is um, that when we're under stress, this um, cannabinoids get synthesized very fast. They cause our uh, neurons to relax, and then they're shut down again, so that you again like nothing happened. So if we encounter stress, let's say we're stuck in a traffic jam and we have to get somewhere really quickly, this receptor, the neurons will get really excited, and this will be the signal that endocannabinoids, the ones we make ourselves have to be synthesized. And they will bind to this side, and they will cause neurons to relax. This is the base, basic messengers that our endocannabinoids have for our bodies, is to induce relaxation, 
to induce rest and to some extent memory loss. So um, this is why they're synthesizing really traumatic events, making sure that we forget what really caused us to go. <laughs> so this is uh, the basic principle we have, and also one of the uh, messenger, one of the reasons why Americans study this endocannabinoid systems really extensively is that endocannabinoids, when they're synthesized in our bodies, uh, they cause us to eat drastically a lot. And this is where, where of course, Americans thought that if we block this, Americans will lose weight. So this is why uh, tons and tons of millions of dollars were invested to study this endocannabinoid system. Okay, so this is basically how it looks in the body naturally, and then also this the same system gets activated when we, uh, when in our bodies uh, we bring, uh, when we bring cannabinoids from a plant or from whatever, uh, the same kind of reaction and the same kind of uh, signaling gets activated. So this is just to give you an idea. So these are the major cannabinoids that we find in cannabis. So these are CBDs and THC and so forth. And these are all effects that uh, scientists have found in the bodies that these cannabinoids cause. So they have from... They do all kinds of things. So some are um, antipsychotic, anti-epileptic, some uh, function on uh, the blood vessels, some are anti-cancerous, some, some are anti-diabetic, some are uh, analgetic, as we all, immunosuppressive, immunostimulant, all kinds of things. And um, I'll try to explain now what the basic biochemistry in our bodies is, why does, do these substances, these cannabinoids, why, do, why can they cause such diverse effects in our bodies? So this, um, the basic of everything is that there are constantly in our bodies, uh, we have millions of signalings going on in our cells, in our organs, in our whole body. And uh, cannabinoids affect this signaling. And this image is just to give you an idea of how complex our bodies are. And this is a basic signaling pathway that is, is, is in one signal, single cell. So, and the basic, uh, uh, I, the basic functioning of signaling is this. So this, um, this is a cell, and on the surface of every cell, the receptors. And these receptors, uh, they're all throughout the membrane, so uh, a cell would be like a ball that has millions of millions of receptors, and every receptor is exactly for certain substances. And when the, a recept when a receptor when a receptor binds a molecule, then a reaction happens inside of the cell, and these errors are all reactions that are happening. And the aim of the re uh, the reaction is to bring about a response in the cell. And the responses are generally done through in the nucleus. So this is uh, the nucleus of the cell where the genes are stored. And usually every response to uh, a binding of, uh, uh, of activation of receptors is that different genes get activated in the cell. So the cell changes something in its physiology. Either it, uh, this is the same as it happens when you eat something uh, with sugar in it, your body will know that it has to produce insulin. Because the sugar that you eat will bind to receptors, and the cells will know that they have to shoot out insulin in your um, blood that will lower your uh, sugar. And it's the same with every molecule that enters in our bodies. Every molecule that has a binding site in our body will cause a reaction, and will cause something different to happen in the body. So this is sort of just to give you an idea how complex these systems are. And this. Um, is an image of the endocannabinoid signaling system we have in our bodies. Our bodies, uh, if we never in our life encounter with cannabis, our bodies have a very fine developed, a very finely tuned endocannabinoid signaling system. It has receptors and it has a good, um, they, they think, scientists have now known over a thousand targets to which cannabinoids function in the body, to which signaling pathways they affect to which responses, to which genes get activated, to which genes get shut down. Um, 
and this is all uh, present in our body. So this is where it all begins. This is a receptor uh, that binds cannabinoids. And uh, our bodies make generally, uh, we now know for sure, two cannabinoids. So this is EAE, an andenide, and 2-AG is um, another cannabinoid that our own bodies make. Um, and these two will get produced, or the body, our body will make them only when we're under stress, only when something um, happens in our body that it uh, brings the body out of balance. Then these two get synthesized, bind to this receptor, cause a reaction in the cell, and the, the consequence of this reaction will be that our neurons calm down. This is the basic messenger. This is why I said that it's an SOS mechanism. So when something goes wrong, the body goes whoosh, we need endocannabinoids, it produces endocannabinoids, and our body goes back to balance. This is the basic biochemical principle of this working. And this happens naturally in the body. But sometimes, well, you probably all know we don't live in a perfect world and we don't live in a perfect society. Sometimes uh, the stresses that we encounter are long-term stresses. Sometimes we encounter toxins in the environment and stuff like that. And this this endocannabinoid system we have in our bodies gets disrupted. Sometimes um, we don't know exactly what causes the disruption, but for many diseases it has been now shown that uh, the disruption in endocannabinoid signaling is the root cause of uh, diseases that will later follow. So um, sometimes it happens that the body loses its ability to naturally produce endocannabinoids when under stress. Sometimes uh, it happens that this receptor is constantly bound and constantly these reactions are overactivated and all kinds of things, well, you can see there, um, here maybe 20 targets are depicted, but in reality there are over 1,000 ones. And in, in either of these cases, if something goes wrong, the endocannabinoid system doesn't work the way it should and it doesn't protect you from stress the way it's meant to be. Mm. So this is about how this happens naturally. And uh, these are the two um, endocannabinoids that I talked about that our body makes. So anandamide and uh, two arachnoidyl glycerol. These are the two that our bodies make and they're both uh, made from phospholipids, so uh, uh, lipid molecules. These are uh, naturally present in our cells. And these, uh, our bodies have a system where they make these two and they cause the, the same reaction in the bodies when they bind to receptors of, as I explained previously. And um, you can see that both of these bind to these two receptors, CB1 and CB2, as I mentioned in the beginning. And different reactions follow when you bind to CB1 or when you bind to CB2. And here are just a few that are mentioned. And uh, um, different physiological reactions that happen as a consequence of these signaling pathways. And this is where we come to this uh, part of the talk where I explain why I think that uh, endocannabinoids uh, cannab cannab and cannabinoids that are present in there are really basically orthomolecular medicine. This is because, so this is THT, the, the most well-known cannabinoid in um, in cannabis, and these are the two cannabinoids that our bodies make. So in structure, uh, they're both lipid molecules, and the main, the main uh, important feature is that they both, all of these bind to the same receptor. So when we, uh, when our bodies encounter cannabinoids from a plant, our bodies will recognize it as its own molecule. It will not be something that is foreign, something toxic, something new, something that the body doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't block anything, but it activates our natural endocannabinoid system. And this is why uh, I believe that it's a perfect orthomolecular medicine, <laughs> because when it enters in our bodies, our bodies recognize it as its own cannabinoid. And it knows exactly what to do with it. It knows exactly which receptors need to be activated, the body knows exactly what reactions will follow and what will happen in the end. So, in the case we have, um, in in the case that something, uh, uh, some dysfunction or some kind of disbalance happens in our own endocannabinoid system, 
Little cannabinoids from plants can be very useful in activating this the same system and bringing about the balance that we lost in our bodies. So, uh, so this is again two neurons. First neuron that gives a mess message to this neuron and then the signaling goes further down and brings about contraction of muscles, release of insulin and so forth. And um, as I explained before, when this uh, whole nervous system encounters stress and gets overactivated, this one, this neuron will produce cannabinoids and bind to this one and cause to both uh, relax and uh, bring about this reaction that is natural in the body to so just to rest, to relax, and to restore, and in some cases, uh, some informations are lost, and in some cases, we really So, um, and the, why we can have such diverse effects when we, uh, um, when we encounter cannabinoids. First is that there are so many molecules. No? In uh, cannabinoids, as I said, we, uh, the, we believe that there are over 100 different cannabinoids in every plant. And the other is that the, these receptors are very differently uh, dispersed throughout the body. So practically every cell in our bodies, and there are 100 million of cells in our bodies, has receptors for this. So what it does is, we don't, uh, so far we found two receptors, but um, I believe that the, with time, science will find more than two receptors. And so uh, we don't know exactly, so for these most well uh, THC, we know that it binds to this receptor, but other cannabinoids, we don't know exactly to what they bind, and we don't know the exact reaction that they cause. So, and even the effect that the same plant can have on different people, it depends on what kind of state the, our own endocannabinoid system is. Is it also, um, it, it depends on that what kind of reaction will follow. So you can know that, uh, let's say, uh, five people take the same medicine or um, ingest the same plant and the effects can be very different. This is because we have individual biochemistry, we have individual states of homeostasis, and when we, we encounter cannabinoids, different things will happen in our bodies. And this is where I think that um, cannabinoids from a plant can be a very good orthomolecular medicine because our bodies recognize it and they know exactly what to do with this. Uh, so this is just to name a few most uh, well-known cannabino well cannabinoids we have uh, in uh, cannabis and the, the, uh, the effects that are well-known in our bodies. This is just to illustrate how different cannabinoids can function. So. Um, this one, let's say, is antimicrobial and sleep-inducing. Other, others have pain-relieving activities, some have psychoactive activities, some cannabinoids don't have um, at all um, no psychoactive activities, some have sedative effects, some have euphoric effects. And these, uh, you can imagine that in the same plant, you have about 100 of different molecules that all have different effects. And when they come into our bodies, they will bind to receptors and cause all kinds of different reactions. And the effect that we see just depends on, on all of these uh, reactions that will happen in our bodies and also from the state that our body was in before. Um, so even basically, uh, our biochemistry in our bodies is fairly complex. And if you... Uh, if your body comes into contact with a plant that has uh, about a hundred molecules that all cause reaction in our bodies, you can imagine that very complex processes go on in the body. So this is just again to illustrate, oops, to illustrate uh, what happens. Um, so these are again these neurons that uh, that have receptors that have receptors, and these green bits are receptors to which uh, cannabinoids bind, and um, so either uh, our own bodies make our endocannabinoids and they bind to these receptors, or we bring uh, uh, cannabinoids from a plant, we ingest them, we smoke them, we do whatever, and these the same receptors get found. 
The first, these are G-coupled receptors. This is well known in uh, cellular signaling. Uh, the G protein gets activated, and the basic signal that happens is that um, calcium in the cells get activated, and this that the concentration of calcium in the cell goes up is a signal that the cell has to do something. And usually the reaction is that these vesicles that have signaling molecules get released, and then this neuron knows exactly what to do. And if this gets activated, this neuron knows exactly that it needs to calm down and uh, prepare the body for rest to, to lower the activity. And once this one knows, our cells are very well connected and a very fast this information travels to all neurons and our entire central nervous system's brains and neurons gets calmed down. So this is basically what um, our bodies naturally do. And this is, again, the same effect that we have when we uh, come into contact with uh, plant derived endocannabinoids. Um, now, these, these signals are fairly complicated in our bodies, and this is why this uh, complexity of cellular signaling is also an explanation why we can see so many different effects. And these are just to name a few research studies that have, uh, uh, that have been done and that are still going on. And if we can see uh, to what, uh, uh, to what uh, bodily functions or to what... Uh, uh, systems in our bodies, cannabinoids have a proven function or that they do something. So the first one is cell apoptosis. Cell apoptosis is, is a program cell death and this is the mechanism that gets disrupted uh, when cancer happens. So cells that were programmed to die because a new cell already uh, was formed, uh, it's a matter that when one cell produces a new cell that this old one has to die. And this is called cell apoptosis or programmed cellular death. And in the case of um, cancer, this, uh, this program is some kind of, uh, somehow disrupted and the old cell doesn't die. So that instead of one new cell, you have two cells. And then um, this goes on and goes on and from the two become four and so forth. And that's why tumors form because there are too many cells. And so it has been shown that endocannabinoid system um, has a function or influences this uh, cellular apoptosis. It has been shown to influence stress, emo um, emotionality, and also inflammation. And uh, it has been shown to affect mental illnesses or these uh, uh, signaling that are disrupted in mental illnesses, endocannabinoids uh, also can uh, have an effect on that. Um, can, cannabinoids have been shown to be very important in chronic uh, inflammatory reactions um, or processes in the body. So inflammatory bowel disease is a very typical um, disease that every second American has. And so it was very well studied that uh, cannabinoids lower these chronic infections or inflammatory reactions in the bowel. Um, as I told you already before, it um, influences appetite which most of you probably also know. And uh, also in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's, it has been shown to affect the progress of the disease. Um, it uh, also has been shown to be very important in the functioning of liver. Uh, and all the biochemistry that goes on in the, in the liver, um, that uh, cannabinoids, are very important. If this natural cannabinoid system in our bodies gets disrupted, livers uh, suffer very, very badly from that. Um, and Huntington disease and chronic pain and uh, stress and all kinds. This is just to name a few. Um, it has been extensively, very extensively studied in um, Almost every disease or every mechanism that scientists look at in our bodies, they find out that, and, that cannabinoids have a function in it. So this is because of all these receptors and because of the signaling that is so complex. Our body functions as a whole unit. And once you disrupt something, it has an effect on everything. Um, there was a, a good story that Americans found a very 
promising, um, which they found that was a very promising drug. Um, so it was one. Uh, it was one that um, it was called Rimbrand, and they found that if they blocked these receptors, that the uh, need for food drops very drastically that storage of fat drops drastically, that the good cholesterol rises and the bad cholesterol drop, that the sugar um, insulin resistance drops and so forth. So they said that they found a cardiologist dream come true drop. They call it Rimbrand and they, uh, they released it um, as a prescription drug in Europe and it was prescribed for one year and all the cardiologists were were really happy because people were losing weight, people had lower uh, body fat percentages, they were, uh, if you look at their biochemistry, they were much happier. Um, and when it, they were just about to release the drug in America, a one year report came back from Europe showing that these people after one year started having serious mental problems. A lot of them committed suicide, a lot of them had psychotic episodes, a lot of them had all kinds of um, mental problems. And that is just because simply the body doesn't function this way that you block this and just one thing happens. Mm -hmm. The body is complex. Once you disrupt something, the effect that it has on the whole body are very diverse and as we, as they saw in this case, uh, many times very unexpected what it can happen. Our bodies aren't very plastic. We'll just delete this and everything will be fine. So, um, and this was, um, of course, then the drug was uh, banned and took from market and never, um, the drug was never in, um, allowed in America. Um, so this is just to illustrate how, what happens in the body when we, um, we come across cannabinoids. So um, uh, the idea was, of my talk was to give you an idea what happens in our uh, biochemistry uh, to give you this information that our bodies, through evolution, have come to make our own cannabinoids, and uh, that this uh, and that this system is very important in many disease processes and also for general well-being, just for a healthy person. Also, this endocannabinoid system is very important, and that if this gets disrupted, many different diseases can um, occur and that cannabinoids that come from plants can, in many cases, be um, an answer to this. But as you can, um, I believe that what will happen now, a lot of debate is for different diseases, whether uh, the, the cannabinoids have to be with THC or it can be without THC, or what kind of uh, ratio needs to be, or the, the medicines that are produced, do they need to be from cannabis or can they be from hemp? Um, if you take in consideration that it's over 100 active substances and that uh, in our bodies different uh, stages of this endocannabinoid system get disrupted, I think what will happen is that it will, we will show that different plants, so either cannabis or hemp, have different effects and they will be most effective for different, um, for different diseases. So let's say THC is important if you have conditions that are concerning the central nervous system because it has majority of receptors there. Mm -hmm. So for diseases that, uh, that where the central nervous system is, uh, plays an important role, there probably THC will be important. But maybe for others where more muscles or internal organs are concerned that don't even have a binding receptor for THC, also other cannabinoids can have an important function. So, um, and even um, nature is very wise in this way. Um, there's a reason why there are a hundred of them. Because when they come into our bodies, they do many different things. And it's not just one that, uh, and also the ratio between these uh, cannabinoids um, has an influence on what our bodies will do with it. So I think that different cannabinoids will show promising roles in different diseases. And that we'll find, let's say, um, extracts from this cannabis or extracts from this hemp have the most promising role for this, uh, this condition because they have these and these cannabinoids. So um, this is 
what I think that will happen in the future. So um, from my perspective, we're now in this emerging phase of uh, no knowledge about uh, cannabinoids. Uh, we have just begun to realize what really happens in our bodies and what kind of effect we have. So I think we're about here now, where we're just emerging knowledge and uh, every year thousands of new papers come out uh, describing what everything new they found uh, with cannabis. And um, I think that uh, um, it will be shown that for many conditions we have in our bodies, especially chronic conditions, um, hemp and cannabis will show to be uh, very promising orthomolecular medicine. So, thank you. central nervous system effects. Mm -hmm. um, it's about um, uh, do you think that this awareness of this fact is uh, enoughly stressed, not just you know what the academia, uh, but how is this among the public or something, because I think that's the most important thing here. Uh, just and try to explain through the through an example of like how a depressed person would react to that or how another kind of... So, um, if you already brought it up with depression, no? Yeah. So with depression, the, uh, the biochemistry um, in depressed people, changes in this way, but not enough serotonin is released. Exactly. And uh, if you imagine here, so if you imagine here, uh, so, <coughs> so, no, <laughs> uh, so in uh, in neurons inside of these vesicles, in a normal person, there will be tons of serotonin that will then. Um, if the cells are happy and the neurons in the right state, will release serotonin and bring you about even more happy. The, ba the serotonin basic message is happy, relax. <laughs> and this is, the body makes it itself and it's very vital not only for being really happy, but also for many other bodily functions. And in depressed people, the synthesis of this serotonin gets lower. And that's why they're all broke. So, and then um, where cannabis uh, pro shows a promising role here is because it activates that these serotonin in the neurons get released into this empty space here, and then a lot more serotonin gets released. Because uh, many times in the depressed people, you could see that they have a lot of serotonin in here, but it doesn't get released, and it doesn't produce the message that it should. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things that, um, from biochemical perspective, where serotonin could affect mm -hmm. depression and the release of serotonin. But just to, to illustrate, for example, um, I studied cellular signaling and uh, biochemistry and molecular biology, and nobody ever told us, not uh, in undergraduate mm. studies, not in the PhD, that there is an endocannabinoid system in mm. our bodies. Nobody. Mm. So even when I started uh, uh, studying this uh, cannabis, I was really surprised to see that our bodies make it ourselves. Mm. And there's an even fish that, uh, that lives 3,000 feet underwater that has the most receptors for this in the world. So we still don't know why. Done. So um, it's. Uh, I think it's really important to understand that this is completely natural in our bodies. That, it, that evolution or whatever Mother Nature provided us with this to begin with. But what about the general knowledge about this fact? How could we do this? You know, that the general publicity would also know that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, uh, not from Slovenia, or maybe not familiar, but in the spring we read in the newspapers um, the medical marijuana is legal, like over the night, you know, they accepted the law. And after that, uh, when we read the small print, we found out it was actually a green light for the, uh, for the synthetic THC. Yeah. So, uh, okay, this is out of your topic directly, and I'm definitely not advocating for uh, synthetic THC, but uh, if you know, please answer, uh, what's this synthetic THC? Because as I saw in your presentation, and as I know, uh, this uh, cannabis hemp is very complex, so it's just not THC, not just CBD, hundred other ones. Yeah. hundreds of them. So, what is this synthetic drug? Is this just one, two, or sim simulating every these CBDs? One. Just one. It's THC chemically produced. Okay. Just this. This. What? This. This is a chemical that they found a way to produce it in a lab, okay. and that's what they did. And uh, in America, you can also get this as a spray that it's supposed to do a few of the beneficial um, effects that cannabis has. But it's the same as I explained before. If you just stimulate this one thing, you do get some response, but it's not even in comparison the same as if you get into a body a hundred molecules, and these hundred have a synergistic effect with each other. It's not just one. Even if you took a hundred of them and you put them in the right, um, if you put them in the body, um, it doesn't do the same effect. There's a reason that they are in, that, in the nature, in a plant, exactly these hundred and exactly in this ratio. So to, to reproduce this in a lab, it's impossible. And even so, if this is just one, you know, one out of a hundred, <coughs> just, that is well known because of this. Okay, uh, I suppose we should get this too tall because uh, we are again forced to buy one big line. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if it's in the context, but uh, with most medicine, it's like when you take too much, it uh, does damage. It is, it is, perhaps, is it perhaps the same way to uh, this uh, kind of so This is medicine. This is medicine. Um, in, in our bodies, this, is, this system is very well regulated. So in, in our body, you know, if it's a healthy, happy body, when these <laughs> Uh, when this, our own endocannabinoids bind here, it gives a message to this cell that it doesn't make them anymore. So it makes a few and it shuts down. But then if you take cannabinoids and you take a lot of them and over a lot of time, naturally the neurons will change. One of the important uh, features that neurons have is that they're very um, plastic. They, they, they learn very quickly. So if you constantly stimulate this, the neurons will change. So it's then uh, very different uh, from person to person what kind of neuronal state they had before and what kind of biochemistry, what it will do. But it, it does. If you overstimulation every day a hundred times, it's not good. What about ten times? The pain is on the biochemistry. <laughs> I'm quite new in this, so I'm not sure if I completely understand, but I'm just wondering, because on the one hand you say that there's specific molecules or parts of cannabinoids that are good for you know, either cancer or a specific disease, and on the other hand you say you should combine them because they all work together. So I'm not sure, should we isolate them for a specific disease or just take the whole bunch? To well, both of it is true. No, we uh, the the results we have uh, that are known. Let's, uh, let's say where we know for these individual ones what they do in their body, what they do in their body, what they do in our body. It, they did it like this. They isolated it and they tested it and saw what happens. No, 
But so this is how they found out that this one does this, and this one is pain relieving, and this one is antispasmic, and so forth. But um, as with orthomolecular medicine, and with my belief as well, is that there's a reason that they're combined in this way in, in the plant. It's not a coincidence that they're combined, and there's not a coincidence that there are hundreds of them. So as a medicine, I would definitely be more um, supportive of the idea that isolates from a plant are taken, not specific molecules, but the whole. Because um, this system is also so complex that we don't know exactly what will happen, and we don't know um, exactly the effects that it will have. So I think that um, nature is very wise in this way. So um, I think that the, to just take everything that is in a plant is a much better uh, idea, and the, our bodies also recognize it much better than uh, isolates or chemically synthesized. Oh, okay. And that would work, even if they are completely chemically the same. So my idea is to, to go with me. Thank you. Thank you.